Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Emily Akterzandi, Managing Director of Atlantic Live, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Planting the Future. We're here today to talk about the future of agriculture, a field currently facing a number of daunting challenges. The world population is booming with more and more mouths to feed. The climate and the conditions for crop production are changing, and the number of farmers is dwindling, down from 90% of the US population two centuries ago to just 2% today. In a series of conversations today, we'll meet the scientists, farmers, and thinkers tackling some of the biggest challenges in a world whose increasing demand for sustenance is only amplified by an increasingly unpredictable environment. We'll hear about the latest agricultural technologies and techniques, and also pose a few key questions. What have we learned since the last agricultural revolution? And what will the next one look like? Will we soon cultivate our crops and animals on a farm, a lab, or somewhere in between? And what are the top ethical questions to be weighed as new technologies hit the market? What will it take to foster the game-changing innovations that can remake an entire food system? Before we dive in, I'd like to take a moment to thank our underwriter, Bayer, for making today possible. And I'd also like to mention that they brought in a live event artist to visually capture today's conversation. So as we're having today's discussion, you can see this being brought to life on the canvas to my left. So now, um, if everyone, just for a few housekeeping notes, if you could silence your cell phones, but please keep them out. Um, we'd love if you could follow the conversation on Twitter at Atlantic Live using the hashtag Atlantic Ag Tech. Again, that's Atlantic Ag Tech, all one word. And we want to hear from you all in the room today. So after each panel, we'll have an opportunity for you in the room to ask questions of the panelists. And so, Let's get rolling. For a conversation on the tech and ideas fueling the next agricultural revolution, please welcome Caleb Harper, the principal scientist and director of Open Ag at the MIT Media Lab, here with Atlantic Live contributor, journalist Joey Chen. Thank you. Thanks, Emily, and thanks to all of you for being here. Um, I'll mention my cowboy boots, I'm feeling like Those this is the sweet. right audience <laughs> for this. Because we're thinking about this, and you know, Emily made this point. Um, our panels today are with farmers, scientists, yeah. and thinkers. And sometimes they're all three <laughs> in one, right? And sometimes none of the above. Uh, no, I think all of you contribute in, in all ways. Yeah. So let's talk first about what we mean by a fourth agricultural revolution. What, what is that? Right, so I, the, the thinking that I have is, you know, the first one kind of gave birth to society, right? That was the domestication of plants, and that created everything, you know, about civilization. Uh, the second one kind of gave birth to technology-based societies. We were chasing tools to chase food, make better food, so horse and the plow and all of those things. The third one, which we're currently in, integrated uh, all those things vertically. Um, and of course, a lot of advent of new science. So biotechnology is squarely a part of the third agricultural revolution. So you know, even though some really exciting things are happening in biotech, I think you have to think beyond that. And the best summary I've ever, I've ever read was a, a scholar uh, who's passed away, um, but was an old time farmer. And what he said about the fourth one is, is he said, his last name was Baker, I'm just kind of blanking on his name, but he's a really, really cool read. He said, the fourth one's gonna be about accounting which sounds like the most boring thing in the world uh, when you're like, the third one, you know, the second one is society, but like a, a full accounting. How much energy, uh, how much water, uh, how much nutrition did you create? How, what was the flavor of that? What, was, what did the supply chain look like? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, what were all of the pressures uh, that you created or relieved by the process of creating food for people? And I think this time in history is a time where we, we have the ability to collect more data than we ever have before. Computing is as cheap you know, as it ever could be. Genetics sequencing is going down uh, dramatically to where we can access that level of, of data very quickly. So we actually can start 
to look at this problem in such a, a way that, that maybe would be imperceivable or impossible to do before. So I think that fourth revolution is information, trust, transparency, uh, you know, more people becoming involved. We heard from the keynote, 2% of the American population, it's not an American problem, it's a global problem. Every continent has issues about who the next generation farmer is. So I think it's more people, access to tools and data, um, and that's, that's what begins to build that forth. So part of your initiative is to, in effect, grow farmers. That is, create farmers where people like me don't think of ourselves as farmers, but in the future, in this revolution, we should become farmers ourselves. Yeah, I think you've got to expand what a farmer is, and that's what's happening every day in our group. I mean, you talked about the kind of interdisciplinary, or, or as the Media Lab says, anti-disciplinary nature of what we're doing. Um, data and analytics farmer, you know, uh, mm -hmm. chef farmer, um, roboticist farmer, mechanical engineer farmer. I have all these young students come to me from MIT, very disparate backgrounds, and they want to do something in food. They don't have any idea how to do it, but they're driven. They say, I want to make a change. I want to make, you know, my generation at MIT was like, I want a job with Google or Facebook so that I can get <laughs> early stock so that I could retire at 30. Like, <laughs> that's not who's coming to me today. And so I think that next generation farmer, they need tools, they need open tools, they need open information, and they need to be networked. This is nothing that agriculture provides right now very easily. You know, when I go work in Votech schools or STEM schools, same issue. They'll have, you know, let's just say a Votech school that, that trains plumbers. You can turn a wrench after you get out of that school for 45 bucks an hour. There is no future for that uh, plant science program from a, that they can see. So they've said, okay, you know, I could go over here and make some money when I get out of high school, or I can go over here and study plants, and who knows, what, do I end up in a field? And it's like, no, you could be doing 10 different disciplines, and you could be applying that knowledge. And I think that's what that next generation farmer looks like. You have created something in the lab, uh, a personal food computer, yeah. which I'm thinking is like George Jetson spewing out food. If but only no. I could dream. <laughs> what is it? So uh, for us, what it is is an open source kind of hacker kit. Um, if you think about the early days of 3D printing, it was a super weird group of people that had a strange tool uh, that they worked on across disciplines. Somebody was a roboticist, somebody was a code writer, somebody was a mechanical engineer. Same kind of thing. Uh, which, what we do is create climates in a box. Uh, you can change that climate, um, CO2, O2, nitrogen, phosphorus, whatever it is you think is cool and interesting, and then it records it and then it can share it with someone else with a box. So agriculture generally studied in the last 30 years genetics, a lot of genetics work because you can, you can port that. Climate and agriculture is harder, it's regional. But now if you can have a control environment or a climate in a classroom 365 days a year, you can iteratively study that. So that's what the food, personal food computer is. People ask me, is it gonna feed a family of two? Not unless they have a, like a mouse, uh, and not unless the mouse isn't very hungry. Like, uh, and so it's a small box, not for feeding yourself. It is a small box that is for tinkering, is for science, it's for creating data uh, on a scale, hopefully, that, that we never have before. And then you create a network. Exactly. So you have, you know, you can email your tomato. That was one of my early things to get me a lab at MIT, is I said, you know, I, I want to be Willy Wonka. I want to zap the candy bar, I want to particleize it, and I want to reconstitute it. And so the idea is grow it, send enough data about it to somebody else with the same tool set that they could just download the data and do it. And if they want to change it because they happen to be a chef and they happen to know that, like, you know, a lot about flavor, they don't have to know about everything else that it took. You know, the, the plant biochemistry, plant physiology, the robotics, the code, they can just contribute their specific knowledge on a platform that's networked. And then, you know, how much of this is driven by what we look to in climate change or what we are seeing in different parts of the world where there's a rising demand for food? How much does that drive your thinking about this? It's huge because I look at it in every one of these food conferences or meetings that we get to, you know, they may highlight five things that are wrong in food. They might highlight 25, they might highlight one. They might say, oh, the food crisis is food waste. And then you're like, oh no, you go to the next one and they're like, oh no, the food crisis is that f small shareholder farmers can't make it anymore, we gotta focus on them. And it's like, no, 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 the food crisis is that small shareholder farmers took land away from the rainforest and we're deforesting, you know, like this, this 20 years of problem identification, which was useful, we needed to hear it. We needed Michael Pollan to do investigative journalism to like raise our IQ. But now it should be about 
solutions. And when you try to go from problem to solution, there's just tools missing in between. There's knowledge, like transparent, open access knowledge missing for people to become self-educated, to take their idea past kind of a, a um, let's say some, sometimes divisive landscape of food into a potential solution. And I think that's, so climate change. You know, I have kids that I put these food computers in and we talk about climate change and, and they'll say, well, the climate's not changing. That's me when I'm a little kid, by the way. I'm like looking up and I'm like, oh, well, you're talking about something that doesn't make any sense. I'm gonna go back to, to playing video games or skipping school, which is what I did. And, but when they have a climate of the past, because they've used old, old farmer's almanac data set points, temperature set points in a box, they have the climate of the present and they have the climate of the future. And they grow the same crop in all three and it looks totally different, then it starts to make sense. Then you have a, a, a process by which you can investigate what does this even mean? And I think that's, that's where it becomes interesting. One of the, the, um, one of the issues that we talk about now in, in one of those silos of, of food problems, problems yeah. um, is the concern I think a lot of consumers have over things like safety, sure. health, and GMOs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where do you go with that? Oh man, I'm the best person to ask for that. Um, well, I kind of so knew that. people That's come to me and they're like, <laughs> they're like, the first question the general person says is, is this GMO? And and you guys haven't seen my my labs and stuff, but they look super weird. They're usually like pink and they have multi layers and there's a lot of sensors and things, so it looks foreign. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, it's not even close to GMO. It's like the other side of GMO. It's what's the phenome is to the genome. It's the phenomena that surrounds a set of genes that causes them to express. And I can talk about that later, but point of the question, I met with Secretary Vilsack, who used to be the Secretary of the USDA under Obama, and he shared with me this study. And I think it perfectly sum summarizes your question. It was what Americans would support or oppose in government policy related to food. So all the things we argue about, highly political things, tax on sugared soda, uh, reform of school lunch nutrition, you know, all the top button things. There was supposed to be a control question, which was mandatory labels on food containing DNA. That's what it said. Anyone else want to start? Okay, so 80% of the American population would support mandatory labels on food containing DNA. How can we talk about GMO when people don't know there's DNA in there? <laughs> Like, and then I was able to give this kind of a, a reveal at a, actually with James Beard recently, I had not, not James is gone, but his people. Uh, and you know, to say to them, the first GMO is from 10,000 BC. Like we've been GMOing our way into living for a very long time. Now there's big open questions on transgenic, cisgenic, on a lot of things, but to stall us at that point is to reject what has caused all of us to be alive today. And I think you have 150 Nobel laureates that have written a petition on the, the never having a human health side effect against GMO. But I'm not here to say GMO is right or wrong. I'm here to say if you have a problem with it, maybe you should know what it is. And then maybe you should grow some. And then maybe you should see it against a conventional. And you could see what's better or worse about it. But that's actually it, right? It's the education piece that's missing. So yeah. how do you conquer that? You take it all radically open source. This is where I diverge from a lot of interest in food that are starting to change their minds right now. But like the consumer, you guys have voted. And I work with all the food, like big food companies, you know, three out of the big five. And they don't know what to do because what you want now is more information, more transparency, more accountability, more sustainability. That, that's just a different goal than what we asked for 30 years ago. 30 years ago, the consumer said, I want more cheap food. And that's what the call was. We thought, if you read back in the 70s, there was like all these crises, every, there's always a crisis. The crisis was everybody's gonna die. We're not, we're, we're, population's out of control, we're not gonna have enough food. And so they solved for that with the Green Revolution. They created more fertilizer, they created biotechnology, they created a lot of things to optimize for yield. The target has shifted because the consumer has shifted, and I think in an amazing way, towards nutrition, sustainability, things like that. The food system is just not geared for it. It was geared for one, optimizing for one thing and doing it very, very, very well. And so now is the time that we can't allow the information about all this to then go again underground, to come up above the surface to the consumer in 30 years, and instead of GMO, we're talking about CMO, climate modified organism, and then the people are like, you know, oh, I don't want climate in my food, you know, like. <laughs> you have- and none of that DNA either. I don't think that the consumer trusts anyone right now, and I think that's kind of awesome. 
uh, because it's a, it's a moment uh, where you have to reflect on what are the values of the companies, what are retailers trying to sell you, who creates trust, who leads the creation of trust, and what is the trust built upon. And that's, that's like, uh, you know, for me, it feels like the beginning of the internet. Like, the internet was totally crazy, and I was there on the commercial part, like, doing weird things, and eventually it had to become a trust network, you know, and it had to become about your peers, and it had to become about how to share information. But the whole internet was built on HTML, open source. The whole internet runs on Linux, open source. Like, you have to have a core kernel that is shared by enough people, and then you layer on top of it. And I think that's what's going to happen in food. And so we are going to talk later this afternoon about ethics. Um, but if you had a top line issue on what, what this food revolution should be focused on in terms of protecting our ethical stance, what yeah. would it be? To me, I mean, I'm, I'm weirdly ethically agnostic in a way and then also super ethical. So, I, I mean, I don't want to decide what you think the food system should be. I want... Uh, uh, citizen science style community to decide what the future of, of that should be. So what that says to me is my two goals in my lab right now, one billion new farmers, and I know that's audacious and crazy, but farmers. when people are like, oh, there's this many billion people by 2050, I'm like, well, maybe a billion of them could be farmers and then we would not have so many problems. So one billion new farmers and the world's largest open data software hardware repository that anybody can use, nutritionist, or dietitian, I'm, I'm obvious, often corrected, uh, school children, um, scientists in a lab, food makers, packaged good producers. Like, we need more transparency, so these two things need to exist. That, that doesn't sound like an ethical answer, but I also think that ethical battles are kind of useless. Like, we have them, we fight. I say, I'm right because I hate GMO and you're wrong because you love it and I love GMO because it feeds the world and you're a crazy person because if we didn't eat GMO, you need to kill two billion people. You know, this is the arguments that we're having and they're stalemates. Like, and, and organic, what does organic mean? You need to challenge the heck out of that right now. So even believing in these camps is causing us so much friction uh, that it's really, we gotta go next layer. And next layer is about who can think about these problems, where's their access to information, and then giving them the tools to network and solve those problems. Quick questions from the audience, because I'm sure there must be some, and you got the guy with answers. Folks? No questions so much. Oh. So maybe you've answered all of them. Uh, Caused too much stress. Your, your, excuse me. When you're building your boxes, uh, do you, do you uh, apply any environmental or energy cost consideration into... Absolutely. So uh, I'm, How's I'm, that working? Yeah. I'm also here as the bis biggest skeptic of what I do uh, because the claims that are going on in my world of like the vertical farm is going to feed everybody, that's also kind of atrocious, atrociously crazy. So like what we do on that, it's actually a really complex question, but I'll answer what we do. We do kilowatt hours per gram. So any kilowatt hour, which any unit of energy that goes into this thing that becomes a gram, we're accounting for. Liters per gram. Amortized equipment, you know, overhead per gram. Labor per gram. Because it's agnostic, because you can't lie. Hardest part is they're like, oh, well, how does it compare to conventional? And it's like, do you guys know that conventional, I tried to do this. I tried really hard. I got this, like, guy from the Nobel Committee to try to help me, and I, he's still getting figured out. Like, it changes, the, the economics of the things you eat change depending on where you live, depending on the time of year you bought it, and the thing that you picked up. So as if that wasn't hard enough, right? You can't summarize this is the conventional energy of in anything in ag. Then I find out, because my family's been in the grocery business for 60 years, they don't even make money on a lot of things they sell in the fresh produce department. Like that's a loss leader to get you into the middle of the store to buy the high value things. So it's already not working. And then if you go back, it's all handshakes, meaning there's no data trail and it's all subsidized. Our food system would not work and still doesn't exactly economically work the way we think it does, even being heavily subsidized. So it's a hard thing to do a direct heads up comparison. And so I've really tried hard to just make undeniable truth. Um, but that is a big part of what I'm trying to figure out. What should be grown in control environments? Urban or peri-urban? What should be grown in greenhouses? And what should be grown in field? But with the goal, not of competing on price and yield only, 
but the goal saying, what nutrition did I deliver at point, at, at point of consumption? What flavor did I deliver at point of consumption? Which really changes how you have to look at it. Other thoughts in the audience? Yep, in the back. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, when you mentioned GMO, it is very difficult not to talk about Monsanto. What's the role of, of Monsanto in your research or in, what do you think about that? Because yeah. it's very hard to skip that. So, some cool stuff. Um, you know, I can sit here and say I don't work with Monsanto. Um, it's not that I don't think that their science is kind of amazingly awesome. I do. I respect the, a lot of the science of what they do. I just have no reason to work with them right now, um, and so they don't play a role in my research at all. I'm working in the phenome or the phenomena side of what they would be working on the genetic side. So eventually those worlds will come together, um, but right now I'm trying to figure out if you have the same genetics and, it, and then you have the Tuscan tomato that's nutty and amazing, what pressure biotically or abiotically was applied to cause that plant to create that tomato that you think is so awesome. So I'm more on the climate decoder side than on the genome decoder. But I will add one other thing. Those technologies for doing that are becoming so commonplace and they're evolving so fast that not even Monsanto can keep up. So you have you know, CRISPR now, you have CRISPR that's just being applied, which is a cheap, cheap way to edit. I've seen high school students use the CRISPR-Cas9 system to edit jellyfish DNA into lettuce. So like, that's high schoolers. So, like, you can worry about Monsanto. I'm pretty sure it's in the process of, of going away in general. But GMO uh, is here to stay for the rest of your life. Uh, you will, everything you eat has been GMO. Everything you will eat will be GMO. But we've only made one. We, I never made these, but they made one GMO for flavor in all time. It's called Flavor Saver Tomato. They made one GMO for nutrition. It's called Golden Rice. Most of our GMO has been for chemical resistance, drought tolerance, pest resistance, you know, things to, to support yield. Imagine now that the tools that Monsanto is using and the science is now available to a lot more people and that the younger generation is the convergence of a bio-digital generation. 70 year, in the 1970s, it was the digital weirdos in their garages. Everyone said it was too expensive. It was never going to scale. Look what happened. Today, you have high school students hacking their own microbiomes. You have CRISPR, Cas9, doing crazy things. This is the beginning of a whole new world of the way that we design biology. And that needs ethical considerations. That needs scientific considerations. It needs open information so that people will accept, uh, you know, accept the findings that, that it has. Um, but I think we're, we're 20 years past Monsanto, and we just saw the legislation on GMO for Congress that, that included CRISPR-Cas9 not being considered GMO, that's a really important one. And then you just saw the settlement between MIT and, and this other school on the West Coast uh, about who <laughs> owns CRISPR-Cas9. So that's even been legislated. So, I mean, so, you know, it, 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 it's here, and it's going to be now scaled. And so forget about Monsanto, it's old news, but be thinking about the new technology tools, how, what you think about them, uh, and challenge your own preconceptions on what is natural. And I'll, I have to end, but like, the biggest question you should ask yourself in food right now is what is natural? Agriculture and farming are not natural. They never have been, they never will be. If you look up the term farming and you look up the term nature, diametrically opposed. So it's always gonna be a conversation of what we can do with our brightest minds, what we can do with uh, you know, our, our best hearts to produce food, but you have to also think of the next 20, 1 million person cities in India. You cannot only be thinking about like the kind of boutique, go back to nature, small local thing. It, there has to be something in between. And I think that's the future of food. And that is that revolution. You are out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caleb. And next, a panel on founders and farmers. Joining us are Dorn Cox, the co-founder and president of Farm Hack and owner Tuckaway Farm, Isha Dutar, executive director, New Harvest, Peter Orr, owner, Fort Hill Farms, and Jeff 
Von Maltzen, co-founder and chief innovation officer, Indigo Agriculture, again with Joey Chen of Atlantic Live. I think I'm losing my technology here. <laughs> so we got the Caleb overview, and these are the folks really on the front lines in many ways of this revolution that we've been talking about. Um, you know, Peter, I think I'd like to talk with you first because I think you are what we know is a farmer. Um, Peter's farm is a dairy farm. You have cows. They give milk. They eat crops. And you are also part of products that are, your farm is part of products that all these folks in this community are eating every day. Correct. Where? Where do you see uh, a real opportunity for, for your organization to be technology forward? In, in terms of, in my particular case, we're, we're a family dairy farm. We're located 50 miles from the hub here and so forth. And uh, we, we produce milk on the farm, but we do it in a, basically in a, in a holistic way with many cyclings and so forth in terms of we grow the crops, feed the cows, produce the milk for you to enjoy. That's mm -hmm. how we greet people on the farm. And we're currently in a situation on my farm with going on an intergenerational transfer in terms of I've been fortunate enough that the younger generation has come back to the farm. Your daughter? My daughter, who is 24 years old, who has a degree in dairy, man dairy uh, practice and uh, production and management. And we as a family, we, ha we are committed to passing our farm into the future and we want to see our farm being working land in the area, producing food for the communities in the, in the area. Is her farm going to look like your farm? Not at all. Not at all. In terms of we're in the midst of, of planning it and so forth, and um, we're doing basically transformational types, types of steps. We're, we're going to be producing energy on the farm from our, our manure. So instead of just having you know, a milk product, and so forth, we're also gonna, gonna be putting in an anaerobic digester to take advantage of the manure that's produced on the farm and making an, um, electricity out of, out of that. And in, and in doing that, we're also um, imposing a whole bunch of environmental good benefits to the farm in terms of what that, that technology that's gonna be used to produce electricity from manure is what's called anaerobic digestion and so forth. And we're going to be the first farm in Connecticut to, to, to put in a farm-based um, anaerobic digester. And, and that will be the, the kind of the new heart of the farm because that is going to take care of a lot of the environmental sustainability things with regards to having animal agriculture. It will take care of our methane emissions and so forth. In fact, we're looking at that our farm will become a very you know, positive um, uh, green situation. And also, in addition to that, uh, to take advantage of that energy that's produced on the farm, we will be, we are building a new um, dairy center and so forth, a new barn for the, the milking cows that will take advantage of electricity and, and technology to be able to manage that, that barn and so forth. Thus, we'll be able to, to reduce the, basically a lot of the physical workload you know, on, on people and so forth. And that's, that's very important. To go back to what Emily said at the very beginning, this is, these are panels of people who are farmers and scientists and thinkers. You did come from a biotech background, which certainly is contributing to your understanding of what you can do here. Um, not only we're talking about changing what a farm might look like in the future, Isha, your farm is also quite different. Can you? <laughs> you're not only changing the farm; you're changing the milk right. in your farm. Can well, you explain it? I don't have a farm, but I, I run an organization called New Harvest. We're a nonprofit research institute that funds researchers where they are in their universities to explore how we can produce foods from cells and so, cellular agriculture. Yes. Explain that to me. Uh, well, we define cellular agriculture as the production of agriculture products from cell cultures rather than from whole plants or animals. So one of our very, very early projects was the idea that, well, milk is largely made of a handful of casein proteins, whey proteins, really tasty fats, and water. 
what if we could produce those proteins using a yeast mechanism um, of fermentation rather than raising mother cows to milk them. And so that is a project that then became its own company called Perfect Day, and they're working towards that goal. And as that was kind of our early stage things, we started these two companies. The second one was producing egg proteins in cell culture. We realized that what was really missing for this field was a strong foundation in academic research. And we also switched gears and decided we wanted everything that we do to be as open as possible to prevent some of the issues that arose from the GMO scenario, for example. And so right now we do not have a farm. We have many different labs and the kind of things that we farm are this big. Um, but we're kind of working to this, towards this goal that perhaps one day there is a farm that can look a lot like a brewery. Probably not exactly the same as a brewery, but you know these large stainless steel tanks where a biotech process is happening within them. But the people who are doing that work, we don't look at them as mad scientists. We look at them as artisans and craftspeople like we do brewers today. Um, and we think that that could be an interesting future. We change a lot what we think of in farming, right, in this conversation. So we mm -hmm. go from maybe something traditional, something very not traditional, Dorn, you are farming, among other things, you're farming soil. Right. I think uh, one of the Im important things that I, I think we have a common thread here is that we're really beginning to just understand the importance of agriculture and not just f farming. And the revolution that Caleb mentioned as far as understanding those those complex microbiomes, both in the soil and in the plant, and all the different productive ways we can employ them, either in a lab, in a container, and where we're looking at it is really on the landscape level. And, uh, and that farming agriculture is really the culture of the field, and that our, and, and farming is really about this collective land management that we're choosing to do. And historically, we've had this process of really land degradation. Civilizations have historically degraded, not improved their land. And what we're beginning to understand now is that rather than taking thousands of years to create an inch of soil, it's really, we didn't understand the process as well enough uh, to really, to realize that what we're actually doing is taking photosynthesis, growing plants, and growing soil through microbial activity at the plant root. So the, we're building essentially a deep topsoil future, and that's not just producing food. That's an important part of agriculture. We talk a lot about that. Uh, but really, it's part of climate regulation. It's part of water management. It's part of uh, ecosystem services. There's this whole host that often, uh, the value of which dwarfs just the food production. So this food production is also important, especially in, in urban areas for distribution, but from a nutrient cycling perspective, growing soil, managing soil, is the role of the, fu the, the future uh, agriculturalist. And it's really a collective action that's not just the farmer on their own. They're the ones taking the action, but in order to inform that action, it's really a process of using the technology that we're developing, a lot of it, especially open source technology, so that it is trusted, taking that data, being able to move from where we have been, relying on expert recommendations that work in general, to being able to move towards site-specific recommendations to transform each individual farm at whatever scale to build soil and uh, collectively improve the productivity of, of that natural resource. Because it's, it's essentially a biological um, accounting book. Yeah. So we can. So you talk about, in a sense, taking data which you can use to enrich the soil that is your, your system. Right, yeah. So essentially, being able to take our. Yeah, exactly. Being able to do what we call adaptive management. So by understanding the system, we can make small changes to it to uh, effectively improve the productivity, reduce the inputs, in, and increase the, uh, the resilience of that system, which in the context of climate change is especially important. So agriculture is really one of the main solutions, not only to, uh, not only to adapt to climate change by holding water and, and restoring degraded landscapes as a method uh, of adapting, but also to mitigate. So we talk about the surplus of atmospheric carbon, but really what we're looking at globally is a deficit of carbon in our soils. 
and and only a, it, it doesn't take a large growth rate in our agricultural uh, uh, soil carbon to uh, have a dramatic effect. So, just to give a sense, uh, you know, a degraded soil might be say two percent organic matter or one percent, which is, represents a lot of our soils, and a really healthy soil might be eight percent. Just a half a percent increase over 10 years essentially puts us on track to, to get to where we need to be with the Paris Climate Accords. So, with the Accords, all right. Um, Jeff, I think that this is sort of the transition to where you are, because once again, what you're doing at Indigo is taking the, the data of what you can now know and using that to, to help the plants help themselves, in effect, in a way. Great description. Um, the, the foundation of what we do is, is focused on the plant microbiome. <clears throat> so first, what is a microbiome? Microbiome is a community of microbes that can live in soil, can live on us, in us, lives on this carpet. Turns out we're all surrounded by microbes. And one of the revelations in, in human healthcare we realized had, had deep relevance to the future of agriculture. And, and that's that um, not only can microbes sometimes harm us as people, if, you've, if you snap freeze us at any instant in time, even when we're sick, the vast majority of microbes that we are relating to are actually vital to our health. Um, and, and it's probably almost best thought of in human anatomy that you know, the microbes that live in your gut and live on your skin are like an extra organ that we've just really started to tap into in the last 10 years. Um, the reason they're so vital is simply that their health, the microbes' health, depends on ours. And about six years ago, we made the observation that, that precipitated indigo, which was that it turns out that if you cut any plant in the world open, they're full of microbes that live inside of their tissues. So that's, well, Of course, they would be. That makes sense, right? It, I guess when you think that microbes have been here for billions of years right. before plants, it would, it would seem that microbes figure out a way to um, cohabitate with this extraordinary home that, that rep is represented by the inside of plants. But, but we had posited that the evolutionary implications of that could be vast, i.e. that those microbes would therefore be motivated to affect any stress that could compromise the plant's health. They depend so on the plant. So drought or other conditions? Every trait important, uh, that's important to agriculture. So drought, stress, heat, salt, cold, viral infections, bacterial, fungal, insects. So, so what we've tapped into is a means by which to borrow naturally occurring microbes that have spent thousands or millions of years in Mother Nature's lab figuring out ways of being able to quite powerfully affect the plant's resilience to a wide spectrum of stresses. And our job is to figure those out with, with data, i.e., what is it about the microbiome of an extraordinary crop or plant that allows it to be that way? Or what is it about the microbiome of a rare plant that's capable of living in the desert year-round um, that potentially is, is driving the plant to be able to survive those extraordinary stresses. So it involves a lot of data and microbiology, and, and now our team is a, just over 200 people, most of whom are scientists, microbiologists, plant scientists, and, and now a growing commercial arm. Um, and what we've been seeing are are um, in fact true to the, the depth of this relationship between microbes and plants, that if you discover the right microbes, they can have an extraordinary impact on a plant's survival under drought stress, under heat stress. And as we've moved our first commercial crops into the hands of farmers, we've been seeing consistent 5 to 10% um, increases in yield associated by simply changing or augmenting the microbiome of seeds at the time of planting. And yeah, changing I, nothing else. Yeah, well, it, I wanted to just jump in there also just to say that the, the overlap with sort of an understanding that microbiome on the outside of that plant uh, root is also just emerging mm -hmm. as much as it's sort of been, uh, and really just in the, in the last five years, I would say, that the, the, the bacterial and fungal populations and the roles they play in soil health and is, uh, is really a revolution in understanding these processes and how fast we can positively affect uh, our natural environment through understanding. It's really this knowledge limited system that we're able to, st that we're really at this point limited by how quickly can we transmit peer to peer our observations to positively affect the system. There's a really important change that really has just been in about the past 10 years where previously you could, 
the techniques to culture microbes were there, and the techniques to painstakingly characterize one of them were there, but you really didn't have the sort of advances in characterization of complex communities of microbes, data scientists to be able to aggregate and under understand that, so that as you understand one piece of the puzzle, you start to understand more and more of the aggregate whole of it, and i.e., therefore, when you solve one problem for for example, our first products were improving drought tolerance and water, uh, uh, water stress management in cotton. It, it opened up a bunch of perspectives by which we could then do the same for winter wheat, spring wheat, start to and do the same Peter, for other crops. this also reaches your farm. A a absolutely. We're in, in a situation for a farmer, one of the number one jobs that we have is to be a, a steward of the land, and that is specifically to focus on soil health. And we, ha we have a particular programs on our farm that, that are there just to augment and to make soils healthier for the future. I want to be able to pass on the soils on in my land that are more productive and so forth to the next generation. And the things that, that I'm hearing on this panel are some of the things that have been recognized by farmers for years. And for a dairy cow, we don't necessarily feed the cow, we're feeding the microbiome that's in the rumen and so huh. forth. That is what and the microbiome of the rumen is what feeds the cow and so forth. On our farm, we mix up what's called a total mix ration, not to feed the cow, but to feed the microbiome inside the cow. Likewise, for soil health, we use what's called a diverse cover crop in the fall time. After we harvest our crops, we go out and plant a, what's called a diverse cover crop, and that is broadleaf and grasses and, and other things to help um, minimize or, or improve the effect of soil compaction. And because we plant different species, we have um, different relationships with different micro microbiomes on each of those species. And when, when that crop is terminated in the next fall, in the next springtime with the next planting, that crop dies and there's a tremendous release or a benefit to the next crop, which is in, in mostly on my farm, corn <clears throat> and so forth. We've been using diverse cover crops on my farm for the past five or six years. This is just what these gentlemen are saying. This awareness has been coming out over the past five to 10 years. And, and farmers do recognize the importance of the microbiome. And what I'm hearing is that there's gonna be some fine tuning, you know, and so forth with regards to overall I keep hearing this you know, from all of you, that the essential nature of open source, just the exchange of information, mm -hmm. wh where it might seem radically different, what the four of you are doing, it all comes back. You yeah. need that. You need that access to well, we, we, we found, I, I think, in the, in, in the back room here waiting to come on stage, we were having a great deal of conversation because we were, were, were meeting one another from different walks of life and so forth, and we do. I, as a farmer, see you know, the commonality in what the messaging is from these, these other organizations and people today. E even with what Isha is Absolutely. doing? Absolutely. Yes. Which is not meant to rival necessarily. I mean, you're not trying to run Peter out of business here, oh. but. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think open source is very crucial because we need to be sharing information with one another if we are to move towards better products and better processes and things like that. And I mean, farming to date has been largely open source, and it's only when we started introducing private things and protected seeds and so on that it kind of changed a little bit. And so I think part of our interest in, in doing this cellular agriculture work open is because we believe it's so early and could be potentially very transformative that we need everybody to, be, to have their eyes on it and everyone to understand what's going on with it and what the implications are so that we can continue to understand what it is as it is developing rather than have it develop behind closed doors and then one day it's out there and we're all consuming it and we never had a chance to understand how it worked or where it came from or why it was even made the way it was. Do, do all of your, does all of your work, we, we talked earlier about climate change and, and the developing world and the, is that always sort of those kinds of issues always sitting on top of of other things that you're doing? Because, you know, we could think in sort of a closed world way about American farming and, and American industry and everything, but really everything you're doing connects somewhere out there to the future of production of food anywhere. 
Okay. I, I would ab say absolutely. I think it's entirely applicable to our uh, to our domestic agricultural production too. That, but I think it's in our collective interest. E even uh, you know the, the fundamental nature of agriculture is independence. You know, and and it's part, but it's the way in which we're able to create abundance from our natural environment on a regenerative way. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a shared human endeavor. By sharing what we're doing, we have the ability to not only improve uh, our local environment, but by sharing it globally, uh, you know, we have a collective interest in improving uh, our climate and our natural resources that really are, you know, we're talking about managing global commons at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to just to to uh, to, to finish, I, I think that because of that, it's in our interest, as you say, to be to trust the knowledge that's that's so important in developing that agriculture, but also to get it in the hands of every farmer who can, every person, I shouldn't say, every person who has an interest in engaging in this. Mm -hmm. We should, I, I think that's an, that's part of our collective interest if we're going to move and progress. A thought that bridges to a point Caleb made, which was that, that agriculture is a technology, mm -hmm. is, is that partially for the reasons you state, it's, it's implications for climate change, it's implications for our health, that the you are what you eat, which is that agriculture's product isn't just food, it, it's us. Like at the end of the day, the atoms from the apples that we eat become the atoms in our stem cells and, and our neurons. It, it's easy to make a case that it's the world's most important life science technology, mm -hmm. and that technology in agriculture isn't just planes, chemistries, tractors, but but it's actually the the biology mm -hmm. of how can we, you know, sustainably and um, with with greater and greater attention to the environment, to consumer health, and to the profitability of farmers, um, enable this beautiful biological process of plants all around the world gathering atoms from the, the air around them and the soil around them and, and converting it into the food that we eat. I, I'm going to encourage people to step up with their questions, but I, you know, I am struck, you, for those who don't know, your company has done tremendously well. Indigo is now one of the great unicorns of this area. Um, does this also represent, though, a realization in industry, in communities, in, in, among consumers, that holy cow, we really, really need to invest in all technologies that bring us food. So I, I think so, but I also think and hope that it's just the very start. Um, so to placing that centrality of, of agriculture, um, it, it doesn't get that, that degree of attention. Like, I mean, if you look at the local university, universities around here, pe people aren't holding agriculture up as, you know, sort of the problem to be working on, where, you know, entrepreneurs, technologists, biologists, physicists would be thinking first about how do we, how do we invent the future of this, this industry? And, and in, the, in the press, it's often, it's very easy to come across doomsday pictures for agriculture, and, and, and many of those have hard facts around them of detrimental environmental implications of current agricultural practices, et cetera. Um, if you take the optimist's viewpoint on that, it's incredible. It, you know, we have a chance in our lifetime to reinvent perhaps the technology which enabled human civilization in the first place and to improve it and make it more natural and make it better for consumers, make it better for the environment. So instead of taking these as givens that they need to be detrimental or that these are trends that aren't reversible, you know, I think in the first instance, better to posit that we could, in fact, globally create a better version of this. Which and we, that's part of Yeah, our, something our that is meaningful to all of us. Um, there's a gentleman in the back here. Um, so the speaker on the right, you had mentioned about how... Who's uh, right? Dorn. Um, no. My right. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned about how if we increase the soil organic carbon by half percent across agricultural fields, uh, we'll be able to draw down CO2 in the atmosphere. And I believe that that is the easiest way to draw that CO2 down. I think the technology is close or there, and we know how to do that, but what's the financial model that's gonna mm. 
allow the Midwest to, you know, the corn, corn soybean farmer to implement that? Well, that's that's kind of the the lovely piece of it is that it's a win. It's one of those few instances where we have a win-win situation that there is an intrinsic value of actually increasing organic matter in production systems. And one of the key pieces is the use of cover crops, which are a biological primer. So I'd say it's not even technology as much as it's biology, as we were saying. And they were in, so there's an intrinsic value in the production system to lower input costs and maintain yields. And that's what the data is really showing. And so it's a, really a process of social exchange. At this point, it isn't a, a, a question of technology. It's about technology transfer, knowledge, knowledge transfer. Um, then we have, uh, on top of that, so it makes sense at the farm level for uh, w uh, water, increasing water capacity, decreasing uh, necessary herbicide use, uh, decreasing fertilizer use, letting the biology do the work of the, the mined and imported inputs. Then we have the public interest in accelerating this process. And so that's where we have some really interesting uh, ecosystem service markets that I think can be built. We have some interim steps that uh, through, uh, you know, there are all sorts of environmental quality incentive programs that pay for practices, but we're on the edge. This is part of the technological revolution and be able to develop this, uh, essentially uh, this uh, nervous system for the natural environment using the low cost of pro uh, observation technology uh, and so, and a remote sensing and so forth in combination. So the drones and the yeah, all soil of this is part of an assessment. ecosystem that allows us to have move from essentially indicators to actual measurement of results on the ground and the portion that we are contributing, uh, either improving or degrading. So we have a, a, again this global accountability that's 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 just emerging to be able to provide incentives. From but it a is an, it is an investment for a farmer, right? It, it is. I mean, you, you so. do have to make the investment to say, you know, uh, plant the cover crop or, or whatever. Your question was specifically, what can a farmer do in the Midwest, you know, to to do some of these things? Like Doran said, use of a cover crop, specifically a diverse cover crop, and also minimum till or no till. You know, okay, those are tremendous uh, technologies that allow for the buildup of carbon in, in soil and not to plow. And, and in general, that's reducing labor, it's reducing fuel costs, it's reducing input costs. All of those things sort of feed into, a, but it, it just requires a shift in culture. And, and the thing is, the, you know, the thing about a cover crop is not new. George Washington, our founding father, <laughs> planted cover crops on his farm. And entrepreneurs should brace for that adoption curve of, of new technologies. Um, it, one more point about business models is, is right now in many ways I think the, the anxiety in the food system is in part because consumers feel divorced from many agricultural practices. And, and that has to change in that if you imagine going to the grocery and not just having, you know, sort of organic as a category or the assumption of industrial agriculture, um, but imagine that parsed into a portfolio of 50 different things where you as a consumer could actually you know, vote as to what kinds of practices should be taking place on farms. And if you could really start to measure sustainable practices and codify them in an open sourced and community fashion um, and create potentially customized logistics to connect specialized agricultural practices to uh, what consumers have available to purchase, you'd open up a means by which to potentially add a dramatic amount of value into agriculture where farmers would love to alter practices um, according to measurable outputs that, uh, that consumers may strongly prefer over, over alternatives. Nutrient density being one of the, the with a, 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 a more rich biological system will is I mean, that's part of the the uh, outcome that I think will happen as we begin to be able to study these things in place. We'll be able to measure the health effects of the agricultural practices mm -hmm. in the final product. This is one of the areas that's that's we've taken very seriously at our farm in terms of uh, ideal. Our our milk coming going off our farm goes directly into the marketplace. I belong to two farmer cooperatives that uh, market directly to consumers, and they're available in the Boston market here cabbage cheese and, and the farmer's cow milk products. And with those products introductions in the marketplace, I get feedback with regards to from consumers. 
one of the biggest things that we hear from consumers as a farmer is that food comes from the back room of a supermarket. The, you know, that's some of the perceptions out there. On my farm, we put away a public area. We host the public and we have open houses just to educate the public how their food is produced. And on, like, uh, uh, in July we have an open house, third, third Sunday of the month, which is National Ice Cream Day. We'll have one <laughs> next year, third <laughs> Sunday of July. And during that time period, we can have over a thousand people show up at the farm. We ply them with a little ice cream, but they learn about where their food is coming from. And in addition, we, we do outreach and, and other educational programs in terms of just telling people, teaching them where their food comes from because people don't necessarily know. And this also gets into a more important thing as some of these tech, you know, technologies are going to start coming onto the marketplace. There has to be consumer education. There has to be outreach you know, with regards to educating the consumers about what these technologies are and what the benefits are to them. Because after all, it's all, it really is all about the consumer. I just want to get a last word from Misha on that subject of education and thinking into the future. On your website, you um, refer to Winston Churchill's quote about in the future, and 50 years in the future. This is Winston Churchill in the 1930s. Yes. 50 years from now, you'll be able to have chicken wings without the chicken. Right. You know, there is, <laughs> apparently we were late on this, but, yes. but he was ahead of the game. Look ahead. Where do we need to be? What do we need to know? What do we need to know about the future or how should we Food. educate people about the future? I, I think um, I want to go back to what Jeff was saying about agriculture and how it attracts or does not attract people. I, I find it interesting that I go to so many panels like this and a lot of the innovators in food science didn't necessarily come from an agriculture background and are trying to get involved and are adapting kind of technologies that they learned from a completely different field into agriculture. I think we need to be creating systems and education that allows for that to happen more easily because right now it's not very easy for someone to even go to an agriculture school or for an agriculture school to work with a school that specializes in biomedical engineering, for example, which is something that we find very hard to do um, as we try and match researchers up together. So I think part of the education is finding those people who do want to build this new agricultural future and enabling them to do so by introducing them to agriculture very early. And I would like to see you know, the best and brightest be excited to go to a land-grant school as much as they would want to go to a more famous kind of school. Um, and I think maybe it's because I'm from Canada that that was possible for me. <laughs> Well, it is certainly a time for inter interdisciplinary thinking in Absolutely. this process. Um, thank you all for speaking with us. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Joey, and to all of our panelists. And now, a session produced by our underwriter, Bayer. So please welcome to the stage Adrian Percy, the Global Head of Research and Development in Bayer's, Bayer's Crop Science Division, and Benedetto Morelli, the Paul Cook Career Development Professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone, and hello, Adrian. Hi. Uh, so, I'd like to start this chat about talking about uh, Boston as a hub for innovation and why Bayer, the crop science division of Bayer particularly, chose Boston as a city to innovate in agriculture. Because if we think about Boston, I think to many of us, the first thing that comes in mind is not innovation in agriculture, that's for sure. At least it wasn't. <laughs> but I think that's, that's really rapidly changing. I mean, to know why we're here, you just have to look out of the window and see this you know, fantastic skyline and consider the you know, amount of life science companies like Bayer who are already installed here to look at the really exciting startup community that is evolving here and, you know, look at the VC partnerships. But of course, you just look down that way and you see some world-class academic institutions. And there's so much innovation coming out of Boston until now, perhaps, until the last few years that's been primarily um, pushed into the pharmaceutical field. But now we're seeing a lot of that coming into agriculture as well. And it's either being transferred from other industries like uh, pharmaceuticals 
or it's coming directly into agriculture. And it's a really, really exciting place to be. That's one reason. The other reason that is more general is, and a lot of it has been discussed this morning, I think companies like Bayer need to step up and be seen in these types of environments where we're talking with consumers, people working in urban environments. You know, as we heard before, um, of the 100% of us that eat, only 2% are producing the food. So it's not really surprising that we're in a society where there is a disconnect between food production and food consumption. And I think it's the role of farmers, of of companies like Bayer and all of us that are working in the agricultural food sector uh, to come out and, and explain what we do, but also to listen to consumers and then adjust accordingly. Okay. And expand, I'd like to expand a little bit on the startup uh, environment that you have in, in Boston here, the vibrant mm -hmm. startup environment, together with the institutes, university institutes like MIT, for example, that are starting to innovate again in agriculture. So, Bayer is this very big company, and of course we all know that um, you are kind of in, in agreement with Monsanto, but at the same time, you also, particularly in the Boston area, you're starting to invest in startup or to have joint venture with startup, like for example, the joint venture that you're having with Ginkgo Bioworks. So how do you see Bayer crop science strate strategically positioned in the Boston area, and what do you think is the role that you're gonna play with the hub? So how do you think that's going to play out? Well, as a company, we have to play different roles. There's no kind of one-size-fits-all, but it comes down to a basic belief that we need to collaborate, that no one company or one entity can solve all of the issues that we've been talking about this morning. You know, how do we feed the additional couple of billion people that are expected to arrive on this planet in the next few years, do that when there's no additional agricultural land available? How do we do that when there is such concern about how food is is, is produced when there is such concern about the effects on the environment. So, you know, all of this is really important to us. And when you look here in Boston, uh, again, there is a lot going on. I mean, to be honest, probably five years ago, we wouldn't be here because as you said, I mean, the agricultural sector is quite new here. There's been people working in this area for a number of years, but it's only now that we really see this kind of ecosystem of venture capitalists, of startups, of university professors working in this sector. And so we want to be part of that. And so we do work. We, we, we've um, created a joint venture with Ginkgo Bioworks, which we're incredibly excited about because we really believe that with their expertise and the expertise that we have within Bayer, we can really bring new types of products which can really support sustainable agriculture. We work with a lot of venture capital uh, groups here in the Boston area, like flagship pioneering, like Anterra. And they're working with startup companies like SIBO, who are also represented here. So there's an awful lot going on that we want to be part of. And so when we talk about innovation in agriculture nowadays, we have many different fields where we can uh, address innovation. For example, if I'm, if I'm thinking about myself like five years ago and was thinking about innovation in agriculture, I was thinking about basically innovation in, in the tools that are used for agriculture. And then when I started to to look more from my perspective to agriculture, I started to see that there's a lot of innovation going on in microbiology, in material science, in genetics, uh, even satellite images, use of big data analysis. So what do you think are the big challenges that Bayer will face in the future in order to manage this interdisciplinary uh, and transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary way of thinking about of agriculture? Because from a university perspective, of course, is a very interesting and vibrant uh, time to be innovating in agriculture, right? Because we can collaborate with many other people, we see a lot of exchanges of information, but from a company perspective, how would that work? Yeah, I mean, 20 years ago, we were pretty much in what we would call, to call a closed innovation system. So we were working on our products, we were anticipating what farmers' needs might be. We're in a completely different world right now. I mean, we work across industries, as you said, satellite imagery, um, a lot of different areas that we need to interact with to come up with products that help you know, farmers deal with the issues they have in the field, but also to produce products which are acceptable to consumers. So it's really working across all of these different areas in order to be successful. Again, no one company, no one approach is going to do it on their own. And it's going to really take a coming together of, of like minds, but thinking in different ways to be successful. And if we go back to the theme of Boston and doing innovation in a city that is well known for innovation in 
uh, material science, um, electronics, and genetics. So how do you see the future of agriculture in a world that tends to go towards big cities rather than in a world uh, where people are living in the country? And how do you see the future of agriculture, particularly in, ru in the rural areas of the world, if you're thinking about, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia? There's a lot of uh, opportunities there to innovate in agriculture, but there are also big societal problems because you have people that are leaving the countryside to go in these big cities. And, and so that's for sure is an opportunity, but how do you see that? Yeah, uh, so I mean, Caleb, I think, was talking about one billion farmers, and sure. it's across the world, in every different type of farming, in every geography, we have an issue of people leaving the farm. And one of the, the things that I think is really heartening to see is with this... Um, Fantastic story that agriculture has right now in terms of the need to increase productivity, in terms of the need to protect the planet. Um, we are actually attracting people back, or people are starting to get excited about agriculture again. It's becoming sexy again, if you like. <laughs> and, and with some of these technologies, digitalization, I think younger people will be attracted to that because, as was said on the previous panel, farming in 20 years is going to look very, very difficult Sure. different to, to farming today. But again, it's going to take collaboration across so many sectors. It's going to take private industry bringing new products to market. It's going to take academics coming up with new research ideas and new, new tools. It's going to take NGOs who are helping to actually get products into the hands of farmers uh, in areas where it's most needed. So again, it's not going to be one, one group or one approach. It's going to be a collaboration across multiple different sectors. Okay. And Keep going with the startup theme. So the typical startup scenario, particularly in the Boston area, are these undergrad students that are in the garage and are inventing something, right? Uh, so how do you think that, what would the message be to these students? How do you think, what are the tools that you think universities, but also big companies can provide to these students to be able to, to start up companies that are germane to the agricultural world, how do we need to teach them? How do we need to reach out to them in order to, sh to show them that there's a huge need for innovation in agriculture, but at the same time, we also need to provide them the tools, right? Because if you think about innovation in informatics, that's very simple because everybody has a computer, can write a code. Uh, so how do you see that coming for agriculture in a, in an, in a urban? So we need to get the best minds into agriculture <laughs> in whatever sector they're working in right now. We need the best statisticians, we need the best geneticists, we need the best engineers who, may, who actually have a choice of working in many different industries. So one of the things is we need to tell the story of agriculture and that's what I believe forums like this are really good about doing. It's like exposing the opportunities and the challenges that we have in agriculture right now. But again, the infrastructure here in Boston that's already been developed for other industries, like you mentioned, is there also for agriculture. The venture capital funding, um, the, the, the mentorship, these types of things are available here and, and people need to access those and, 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 and reach out. Yeah, and so I think that definitely they would need a, a need to have industries and university working together to show students basically new pathway for innovation that are germane to agriculture because we're going towards this world that is gonna explode in terms of population and we heard there are problems in soil degradation, being able to increase the output while minimizing the agricultural input. And, and so I, I think I really thank you for this very nice chat and I hope that Bayer will be very well positioned in, in, the, in the city and will thrive. Thank you, thank we're you excited to be here, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian and Benedetto. And now, transitioning for a conversation on the ethics of innovation. Please welcome Issy Rosen, the Chief Business Officer at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. Bob Robotsky is the Director of the Feed and Feed the Future Partnership for Innovation. And Emily Broad Lieb is the Director of Harvard Law School's Food, Law, and Policy Clinic. And to lead the conversation, please welcome the Atlantic's Washington editor-at-large, Steve Clemens. Hey, folks. <clears throat> Greetings. How are you? Um, it is, I'm sure it's been said to you, but it's great to see so many people here. And I mean, we're not in Tulsa or Milwaukee. I mean, this is amazing to see so many folks interested in ag here in Boston, which I think is saying something about Boston, what all of you are doing. 
So let's get into ethics. I am so uncomfortable with ethic discussions because I used to work for Richard Nixon at the end of his life, and I, I was the first director of the Nixon Center. But it does raise an interesting question out of the foreign policy area. In, in foreign policy and national security, we have, we have foreign policy realists, and realists tend not to get lost in sentiment and heart and hope. Uh, and you've got uh, foreign policy idealists who want to carve the world to make the world in a better way and, 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 and to have justice and and empowerment, self-determination. And so there's sort of an interesting tension around that. I'm interested in whether in the ag area and in the innovation area, uh, and EC, I know you're not an ag person, but you are uh, involved in other key ethics issues around this, whether or not there's evolving a kind of tension over innovation idealism and innovation realism. Mm. Uh, and let me start with you, EC, because I know you work with CRISPR, and CRISPR is right in the middle of a lot of this. That's right. It wasn't my choice to get involved with ag. It's just happened this way. Um, when the Atlantic calls. <laughs> no, it's not the Atlantic. It's CRISPR. Um, when, we, when we first started working with CRISPR and, and, and thinking about how, what the impact of CRISPR on the world, we were thinking all biomedical applications because we're a biomedical research institute. Human therapeutics, how it does it impact human health and research. But then the ag company started calling. It says, well, we want to use it for ag. I said, well, what do you do in ag? <laughs> Why do you need CRISPR? And this is when I started learning about the ag and the component and the potential of CRISPR in ag and increasing yields, drought resistance, um, and the potentials may be hopefully changing many, many lives if you can bring uh, seeds to Africa that would not be as fragile as, as mm -hmm. those today. The question is, how how do you structure two things? One is how do you structure the right framework for disseminating CRISPR to the world to enable ag? And that's talking about the licensing framework. There's ethics involved with that because do you want it in as many hands as possible? Do you want to give it exclusively to one player who will invest more and so forth? And the second one, because we don't understand ag, we were worried about what does the license need to include. For example, in urine therapeutics, we know that we don't allow for germline editing because we don't want to create uh, genetic changes that will go through generations. And as we're working through this, the thinking about how do we license in ag, uh, Eric Glender comes to my office and says, so what is it? that we need to worry about in ag. Like, I know we worry about germline editing. Is there something similar in ag? He says, I have no clue. I grew up in Tel Aviv. I know nothing about ag. Yeah. <laughs> so then we started having the conversations. What are the ethics associated with the ag licenses? And who regulates it? And do they understand the science? Should we worry that they don't understand the science? And therefore, we should put restrictions in those? And, and we started thinking about those issues. And we did end up doing certain restrictions in our ag licenses. We can get into But this, this was way. sort of self done. Emily, I know you're a lawyer. Do you trust self regulators? Um, this guy? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> I mean, but I'm, I'm sort of, as we see the evolving science and impact, it's really interesting. You're talking about germline, you know, germline. And I know, I don't know if it's CRISPR, but mm -hmm. I know that, say, for instance, in certain kinds of mosquitoes and radiate related, we're thinking about That's actually right. uh, affecting the germline of a, of a, 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 a species of, of, of insect, right? So we're, 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 we're engaging in things that five years ago would have been so over the ethical line as described then, I think. Uh, and, it, and it made me kind of think about, you know, when, when, when a lot of these innovations were coming on, we began to sort of have uh, articles not in the Atlantic, but in, 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 in other publications on designer babies and what you could do. And it made me begin thinking about designer crops, designer corn, which is what you're doing, designer wheat, right. designer others in which, you know, those things are possible. And so he just said that they be, they've, they've kind of initiated their own uh, restraint, if, if you will, and you work as a lawyer thinking about food regulation. Mm -hmm. um, how comfortable are you leaving it to the party doing the innovating to do the regulating? Well, so I think there's there's a couple pieces of it. One piece, it gets to this issue that law is sort of always playing a game of catch up. Because we write we write our regulations around food, around other things at a time where we're looking at farms, like we talked about, you know, what you think of as a farm, and we're regulating farms, and then we think the product of that farm gets packaged, and it's food, and what does the labeling look like? And I think there's just fundamental changes going on, and what we've seen is that our agencies that regulate food don't have good processes in place to do this. So it's it's heartening to see you know the institution coming up with its own ideas of here's the ways we want these to be used, here's the restrictions. 
Um, and it's great to hear about them being so thoughtful. Um, but I think it, there's also this question of now when these agencies get their act together, what mm -hmm. are they going to say? Is it going to be the same or different? Um, so, um, Is there a good statutory framework out there for evolving science? No, there's really not. Um, and I, I would say I'm, I, I, hate, I hesitate to say in this current political era, we need a new statute and we're going to get something really great passed, but we really just don't have a good solution. Think um, long term. Yeah, right. And, and, you know, um, but if you look back in the 80s when we first started trying to figure out regula regulation for uh, genetic engineering, we, mm. we sort of said, we're not going to create new legislation. Our agencies can just handle this. But the explosion of innovation, of new techniques, of questions of not just when you're looking at changes to seeds, but also changes in animals. Uh, you know, who gets mm -hmm. to call the shots on that? And, and it's really unclear right now. Bob, I want to get to you in a minute, second on feeding the world, but I just, I, I want to go back to this patent thing for a minute. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the Atlantic cover stories that we published, I don't know, 15 years ago, it was a long time ago, had to do with the Bayh-Dole Act. And I don't know if people, if it's probably too wonky for you, but the Bayh-Dole Act essentially helped universities make money out of the innovations to create new partnerships, to license technology, and to take a share uh, uh, in this. And it, and it, was um, purported to have been part of this incredible innovation boom based at universities and helped promote a lot of partnerships with industry. One of the downsides of it, particularly with you know, the case that, that uh, uh, the particular Jennifer Washburn was looking at was Alzheimer's rats, all, rats used in Alzheimer's, that there were certain things they were discovering and that as companies were engaged with universities, they didn't want that, that those discoveries shared with their rivals. And so it began to diminish the commons. You began to sort of take this scientific commons and create market enclosures. And I, you see, when you were talking, that all just came flooding back to me, that, that piece from 15 years ago, because you seem to, what you and uh, the Broad Foundation, what MIT and Harvard are trying to do, is to break a logjam. And I found that very interesting, that you want to say, hey, we don't want to have this, you're going to put patents out. If, if folks don't know, they've made an agreement to put patents out for free to take one of the licensees and to compel them to, to create non-exclusivity exclusivity and patent. So it, are you worried that in this evolving area that it's already getting too chopped up, too yes. stuck in ownership struggles? Yes, that's exactly what was the concern in the ag space and CRISPR. Um, as I said, we're thinking about... So why don't you give people a quick profile, because they may not have read the yes. 47 pages I did on it. <laughs> uh. mm -hmm. um, so first, to your first point, yes, absolutely, we worry about... And this thing just I know. Fell. It's always the left ear is a problem. Uh. So we have extensive discussions internally. What type of technology should be licensed exclusive, exclusively versus right. non-exclusively? Our default is non-exclusive licensing unless certain technologies like a th specific therapeutic that we know that if you license non-exclusively, basically is a death sentence to this technology because nobody will invest and the buyer people can tell you how much it costs to make right. a drug. It's in the billions of dollars. Nobody will invest that, that amount of money to make a drug unless they get it exclusively. But where is the line? Therapeutics clearly needs exclusivity. Mm -hmm. Research tools clearly should not be licensed exclusively. And what you talk about, the Alzheimer's mouse, is a research tool. That should never be licensed exclusively, in, in our view. And you're correct, certain institutions do license those type of technologies exclusively. And this is similar to what happened a little bit with CRISPR. So when we thought about the licensing framework for CRISPR, we spent a lot of time thinking about the different applications of that technology. And basically, we said it's a non-exclusive for research and for all applications other than the application as a therapeutic in people. And by the way, this one is also should be limited. The exclusivity should be limited in this application so other entities can come in and develop therapeutics as well. So this is the framework. And we spent a lot of time thinking about this and negotiating this with the investors of the company we started and with the entities who wanted to take licenses because everybody wants exclusivity. Monsanto comes in, they want exclusivity. Pioneer comes in, they want exclusivity. Sanchanta wants exclusivity. Everybody wants it. But then it means you give the technology to a single entity. We thought it's a bad idea. We did non-exclusive. There is. There are some foundational claims in another institute on the West Coast that some of you know that there's still conversations are going on at the patent office, and now it's at the Federal Circuit talking about who really owns or 
who should get the CRISPR licenses. Um, that entity, that university, licensed the entire CRISPR portfolio exclusively to one company. Mm -hmm. That one company turned around and licensed the agricultural use to Pioneer. So we had a situation where Pioneer had exclusivity to one estate, and the rest of the ag field could take non-exclusive licenses from Broad, as we've been doing. And we were worried that if it turns out that the other patents are necessary, um, it would create a situations where there's only one player in the ag field that has access to the technology. So we had conversations with... I.e. a monopoly. Yes. Um, now, Pioneer were worried about the opposite. What if what they license exclusively is not is useless because right. what they need is the broad IP. So they came ask and asked for a license because they knew we were given non-exclusive licenses. And we said, we'll be happy to give you a license if you agree to now sub-license your estate non-exclusively to every ag company. Mm. So you can imagine that conversation, how that went initially, but... But you were raised in Tel Aviv, so I'm sure it went well. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah, you got it. So, yeah. So what we announced a couple of weeks ago, that they agreed to do that. They will get a license to our technology. In exchange, they agreed to make their technology available to everyone else, and there's template licenses, and people can come, and many have already to request the joint license. So, Emily, is it healthy to have that much deal-making around something that's coming <laughs> as a result of really academic base or some government support, innovation, and research? I mean, I just wonder, should we all be worried? Mm -hmm. Are you worried? after you hear this story. I mean, he, he's telling the story of saving the day, but I, I can imagine a lot of cases where it's not yeah. that, and we're talking yeah. about the cutting edge of the next generation of science and really changing uh, what's possible in ag, right, and in, in production. Are you worried? Yes or no? Well, I'm worried about something maybe different from what okay. you're worried about, or I don't know what you're worried about. We're gonna but get you, Bob, I, I think there's, yeah, there's but, yeah. a piece of it that is this question about you know, the patent holders and what right. and, and how they're controlling that and whether they're sharing it. And it's been heartening to hear this the you know, this opportunity to not have exclusive licensing, make it open, allow people to use this technology in the agricultural space. Mm -hmm. And what I worry again about is just then more and more this this technology is in the hands of more and more people. Right. Which is great for the experimentation, but then the lack of regulation actually worries me even more because it becomes very cheap mm -hmm. and very easy. And we heard earlier about um, making jellyfish with legs, and I have no strong feelings about jellyfish, but um, but it does start. I have to, no you know, problem with jellyfish with legs. <laughs> uh, uh, as long as they're not coming after me, I'm okay with it. But um, but you know, it does get into these questions of who's calling the shots then on. Um, this this technology that's right. now a lot more inexpensive than it ever was. Thank you. So Bob, we've we've talked a little bit about what's going on in, in, in you know CRISPR innovation, gene editing, you know these kinds of things. We have the legal framework being doubted and debated, and you're now responsible for taking food to the world. You know coming out of this mess, and and you're I know you're an AID contractor. You work a lot, uh, as you were saying, in trying to help um, areas of the world that are that are working off 2,000 year old technology and help help them jump ahead. And so maybe give us a quick snapshot of that. But I, I just want to put in a context that you, you're you taking technology that's evolving out of this and help help taking it abroad. And I'm interested in how you see the ethical uh, dimensions of that. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. And I'm um, happy to be between my lawyer and my scientist here. Yeah. I, mean, I think I'm, I'm in good, good company. You actually feed people. Uh, well, we try. People. I mean, as you said, the, the technology in use by, let's say, half a billion farmers in the base of the pyramid, the, 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 the most less developed countries, uh, who feed probably uh, three to four billion people worldwide, um, is, is is need, in need of an upgrade. And so accessing that and getting it out to these, uh, to these people, um, the access issue is really the issue. It's not more um, as far as licensing or, or producing it. It's there, it exists. So when you can do that and when you can double or triple incomes um, from a dollar a day to three dollars a day, you have an amazing impact on people's livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And so we're working uh, through a U.S. government-funded uh, program to what we call deleverage the investment that companies need to make to, to move technologies into these marketplaces. There's very high costs in, in uh, setting up uh, the marketing team to demonstrate this, show people how it works. There are no extension systems in these countries, so how do they learn about these products if it isn't for somebody out there trying to sell them? Um, 
So this is, this is something that we're trying to do. We're working with the private sector to do it. Uh, we're trying to leverage. This is something that came out of the Obama administration, the Feed the Future program. Well, see, I was going to kind of keep that quiet because I didn't yeah. want to. I mean, how much, how much are you funded at? Um, Your we, government, we, have, uh, we have about a $50 million fund, um, yeah. and it's been fully funded. And actually, to, to their credit, I think uh, Congress is really supportive of this idea. Um, they believe that food security means national security, mm -hmm. it's, as well as it being the right thing for Americans to do. We have resources to do this. We have know-how to do this. And it actually helps us build markets so for So the current our Congress, uh, GOP controlled, is as committed to what you're doing and funding and supporting this message of, of, of smart ag abroad that, they as it was before. They are absolutely as supportive, which is, which is great news, I think, for, for people in this line of business. Let me ask you another bit about the ethical side of this. And, you know, not that I'm any expert on this, but one of the things I have heard about the tension points about our engagement on the ag front with a place like Africa mm -hmm. um, is that you're on the technology side, but there are others that are in the food aid and food provision side. So right. one of the things that people are out there trying to do in Africa is get markets going. And you know, a, a French development guy said, look, if you want to really move the needle on, on understanding what you have to do, you have to help the woman farmer in Congo trying to raise cotton, get into the global market and not be wiped out, or mm -hmm. any other staple or product in there. And what they often find is you get, you know, markets going, you bring in technology, you get it going, and then there's some uh, act that leads to a massive amount of U.S. food aid. And that food is dumped into the system and blows out the market. And it raises an interesting question about, about ethics mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how you create sustainability and increase in productivity in these areas when uh, you can have a tsunami of competitive free product that, that's paid for by the U.S. government right. that comes in. H have you ever dealt with that? We have, actually, uh, dealt directly with it. And um, it is an issue. Um, I think that the whole idea of food aid makes sense in places that lack food. Um, as, as organizations that do this as, as, a, as part of their business, a world food program specifically, they recognize this and they, are, they have a commitment to buy more food locally um, and redistribute it. The distribution is often the problem. There's an area of one country that lacks food a, a certain season and another area which may have a surplus, and there's the Congo River in between. So how do you, how do you move it from one place to the other? Um, World, food Pro, uh, World Food Program is actually working on that issue. Um, I think the U.S. government really tries not to flood markets that are in surplus. Mm -hmm. they, they have something called the Bellman analysis that that actually um, looks at markets before they dump food. Right. And if they're sufficiently... So there's awareness of the... There of is, the yes. Yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you, the, 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 today, and the, to all three of you, I, I was, had the privilege of moderating a session on vaccines and vaccine science and where we're going. And it's, it's similar to this conversation. Amazing new possibilities. But one of the interesting things, there was an amazing imam from Minnesota uh, uh, and the head of the Department of Health in Minnesota that were responding to an outbreak in measles, 79 cases of measles earlier this year, um, because they had been led uh, to believe that vaccinations were bad. And so it raises an interesting question of embrace of science or rejection of science for whatever reasons. And, and in this particular case, bad things happened. Uh, and this imam tried to culturally bring the Somali uh, 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 population back in it. Very moving story. But it's an interesting question about GMOs, because all of the scientists that we talked about today, you know, in food, and I said, well, tell me more so we can uh, bring this to this forum in Boston, that, that is there a tension between uh, the GMO world, the organic world, the, uh, uh, I was out visiting Hampton Creek recently, the, the, the folks that want to make hamburgers out of plants, mm -hmm. and, and but, but a lot of it is, is it, is it love of science? Is it rejection of science? Where do you think we're at with that? Um, I think we have to be very careful uh, about uh, how we go about condemning or embracing science. Um, I think GMO is a fantastic example. Essentially, it's been proven to be very effective. Um, there's certainly a bullseye on Monsanto for using GMO to promote uh, uh, an herbicide product that makes them a ton of money. Hmm. However, um, these have implications, and it goes back to the access of science. In Africa, only four countries out of 54 
allow GMO um, seeds into their country. Mm. So essentially what that does is it really, um, it really scales back the potential for them to produce more food. Um, so, so but, but on the other side, doesn't it assure that they become a haven for future biodiversity and future products that may have been, uh, um, I, I, I you know, think wiped out in, in, in I mean, I, I'm sort of interested I, in this. I, this I, think, bio, yeah. I, I think, yeah, maybe, but um, immediately, I think what they want to do is put food on their table, make, make a, a livable income, and have meat more than once every wedding or mm. funeral. Um, so so they, they want better nutrition. They, they need to grow more food to, to make that happen, and they need to make more money. And so not allowing GMOs affects that. Right. So, so I just mentioned I, I was at the World Food Prize a couple of weeks ago. It was in Iowa in Des Moines. And there was a CRISPR panel uh, talking about the potential of CRISPR, and there were a few people that work with not-for-profits or developing crops for African countries to increase yields to, to provide um, more nutritious food and, and larger amounts of food. And at the end of the panel, the, you, there were people that from developing countries, specifically from Africa, that got up and pleaded that we get the education right. What they were mostly worried about, that, that within their countries, people said, no, 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 we don't want any foods that was crisperized. We don't want, we're afraid of it, we don't want to use it. And one after one, there were multiple speakers who got up and speak, can you please get the education right? Can you please get the education right? We want to make sure that we can actually get access to those mm. seeds and those plants. And they were worried that there would be a backlash, probably the same as they have yeah. against the GMO. Yeah. That was the one very clear uh, request from developing countries. And I don't know how we get the education. Mm. <laughs> Emily? <laughs> well, I'll say it's interesting because it's sort of the bringing together of what consumers want and are willing to try or buy right and that you know transparency angle this kind of regulatory questions about what's regulated how and by what agencies what has to go through a different process and then what's good for for industry that wants to be able to innovate um, and I don't think we've gotten it right I really think we did a bad job on the first wave of, of genetically engineered you know GMO crops and I'm hoping we can do a better job because there's there's so much potential now. Um, so I think going back earlier, EC was saying something about, you know, the cost of bringing new drugs to market. And I think that, you know, whether we think there's ways we can make that cheaper and quicker, that might be true, but it's because there's really strong regulation. Um, there's a lot more accountability on what you have to do. I think on the food side, we, it's not clear what that is. And um, if there were more of a process where consumers could understand, here's what's going on, there's a way to weigh and there's a way to be educated. Um, and also bringing some of that science into the government agencies too, because mm. I think it's they're struggling with it as well. Mm -hmm. I want to go to the audience soon, but I want to ask you guys something else. Um, I, I, has any, are, are, are many of you ag people? I hope any of you are ag people. Has anybody ever heard of Chino Farms? Any any Chino Farms people? Yay, one person. Mm -hmm. Cool, a little bit. That's great. So Chino Farms is a 5,000 acre farm. Probably other farms like it, but it happens to be the one I was at last week uh, mm -hmm. on the eastern shore of Maryland. And about two-thirds of the farms are traditional um, mass ag production, chemicals, all the kinds of things. I think our underwriter would be very uh, uh, into that. And then there was another dimension with, with which our underwriter would all of you do, which is a research. The other third is donated research. There are 91 bird nets, for instance, and so they, they, they tag birds. And then they've got other areas where they're looking at whether or not with, with border... Um, uh, border ranges and certain kinds of trees or whatnot, can you basically affect what uh, flows into the water, into the Chester River? Mm -hmm. And and I guess he's been working with MIT, with Harvard, with other places that are in the ag area on a long time, of basically using this working farm part in, in, in a, a traditional full-based uh, uh, farm that everything is there, and then the other what can we do to do it, and what are the costs to farmers? So looking at, you know, what are the cost impacts if you basically take part of your farm out of production, you create these borders, are they effective, are they not? Uh, and, then I, and then I think another um, interesting dimension there is that the person who's actually running the farm, who runs it uh, as a business, um, has moved part of what they have under cultivation into organic production because they get so much more price for that uh, in, the, in the local region, in the community. And so I'm, I'm interested in the question of, as we talk about ethics, if I were uh, a business conglomerate and were 
highly unethical and you were a business conglomerate and were highly ethical, who would win in the end? Who do I want I mean, to win? And, and maybe, 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 <laughs> that, win. maybe that's the wrong question. But as I see people struggling, like at Chino right. Farms with Harry Sears, or you see this going on, I'm interested in whether the questions that we're talking about are genuinely real when it comes mm -hmm. to food production, trying to get it right in the future, trying to do this, or are our efforts to think through some of these questions of better practices, ethical practices coming to this, a fig leaf over just, we're gonna keep going the same direction of, of less biodiversity, more, you know, we, we may, science may drive us into greater and greater efficiencies that may in fact not be the right choice for society in the end. I'm just, mm -hmm. quick, quick thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I understand that concern. I think what's interesting with the new technology is that I think we're gonna end up seeing a lot more experimentation, perhaps than the first wave of genetically um, engineered crops. So I think there's a lot of potential there for change. And I think also we've seen um, you know, there could be potential as well for things to be more sustainable using our resources more effectively, not just better for companies because they're able right. to sell more of their products, but actually better for nutrition, better for the land, better for the soil. Bob? Yeah, I, I think that farmers basically want to do the right thing. I mean, they own the land and it's their, their major asset, so they don't want to mis, you know, misuse it. I think that you're going to see a, a, a lot better technology coming out. Um, I think there are going to be a lot more, a lot less chemicals applied. There's going to be um, uh, um, gene editing uh, that that can help prevent pest damage. Uh, there's going to be more biological products. Mm. Um, or the organic movement is, you know, well documented, and and I think it's it's um, mm. it's a big market that farmers want to get into. Yeah. Any closing thoughts, Isi? Yes. Um, I have to believe, and I do believe, that advancement in science would lead to more ethical practices and more diversity and the ability of more entities to compete. And part of the way they compete should be around the ethics and does the public accept what they present to them and their business practices, practices or not. Hmm. And if you go from a model where there's one conglomerate or one entity and were their choices, I think ethical behavior should be one of the considerations. And I think regulators have something to do with this. Well, before well. I go to the audience, I just want to remind everyone we did talk about jellyfish with legs, uh, <laughs> if nothing else, and what you can do with CRISPR. But let me open up for you. Yes, hi. We're going to bring you a microphone right here. Oh, yes, okay. hi. Thank you. All right. Uh, my name, oh, you hold it. Yeah. <laughs> my name is Shavella, and I'm from the Food Project. And um, this is just sort of a question that was based off of the last group and sort of coupled with what you've been talking about now. Um, just thinking about us as humans being stewards of the land and us being what we eat. You know, we are what we eat. Um, what, this is a two-part question. How do you think cellular, cellular agriculture is going to rival our now unnatural agricultural system? Um, because it will, at one point, rival mm -hmm. that. Okay. Um, what happens to the regular farmer, and how does that economically affect the bottom 80%? And also knowing that academic research is limited and we're just now discovering five years ago that biomes exist and microbiomes exist. At what point is it safe for people to actually eat these um, experiments and thinking that <laughs> we're, you are talking now about products and I feel like we've strayed away from the fact that it's produce. Right. So, you know, how is that, how are you thinking about that ethically that we're now talking about products as opposed to produce when it comes to agriculture? So. Cellular ag and microbiomes, if I can do short form. Uh, yes. Um, I think there's going to be a niche for it. Um, it depends on consumer acceptance, uh, really. Mm. And, uh, you know, if they can make um, um, meat out of a Petri dish and it tastes really good and it's inexpensive, maybe, maybe I'll go for it. I don't know. <laughs> Will you? Can, can I answer yeah, the second, yeah, the second question? I think gets to this point of, I think you're right that you know, how do we make sure these things are safe? Who's the guinea pigs? Are we just putting food out there into the world and saying, oh, people got sick? Uh, that's where I'm worried. That's mm -hmm. where I think we need to do a better job to ensure that there's a regime in place where we're testing these products. We know what's, you know, we know what's safe and we know we're putting things out. Um, and I think it's better for industry too. I think right now the uncertainty, I would say, I don't know if this is true in CRISPR. I know it's true in the cellular agriculture space that the lack of a, an answer on what agency is going to regulate and how right. means that it's very difficult to actually make progress in any direction. So I think it's going to be better for consumers and better for industry if we get it right on what does that testing look like and who's doing it. Yes, any quick thought on that? No, I think you covered it really well. 
Well, I'm going to uh, bring it there. I, I do want to say in, in response, because you know, sometimes when we're short-forming uh, conversations like this, we, we even I, uh, and particularly I, tend to uh, overstate some things. And we, when, I, when I sort of look at it, I you know, started out as a blogger uh, wanting to take down the Washington Post and New York Times, <laughs> which I saw as homogenized blobs of, 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 of news. And, and when you look at what's going on out there and you're honest about it, it's a much, much more rich uh, uh, field of farmers and players and producers that that you know I always I think your question is very interesting because it implied are we going to continue going in one direction and the fact is that that innovation can happen you can go down to a micro level you see urban farms you see uh, other other unique farms coming in so I just want to make sure that that is noted and in the conversation because I think it would be uh, overstating it to say we're going to end up with only mammoth side production that that, that wipes out uh, certain folks maybe that's a concern but I do. I do think it's richer uh, from what I've seen around the country and the world um, than we sometimes give light to. I want to thank uh, everyone here. Thank um, Emily Broadlieb of, of Harvard, the, the uh, Law School Food Law and Policy Clinic, uh, Bob Robotsky of the Feed the Future Partnership for Innovation, and Issy Rosen uh, from Harvard and MIT, and uh, as Chief Business Officer, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you again to all of our panelists. And now for a panel on seeding discovery. Welcome David Berry, a general partner at Flagship Pioneering, and Emily Reichert, the chief executive officer of Greentown Labs. And again, joining them on stage is our own Steve Clemens. Thank Great. you, everyone. OK, guys. Thank you for joining us as we uh, wrap this up. You know, I'm, you, were, you were in here for the last question that I think was asking about, you know, the diversity, what's going on. And, and Dave, I want to start with you. How would you answer that question? I'm actually really happy you answered it because I was sitting there on the side over there saying, I wish I got this question. Ah. <laughs> uh, so it actually brings up a couple of points. First of all, I actually think one of the biggest issues in things like food and agriculture is it's filled with so much misinformation. Mm. And I think people are making decisions where they're operating on not just misinformation, but almost a degree of deception. So for example, I'm sure there's a number of people in this audience who eat things like chicken. Chicken, of course, is sprayed in its own feces, mm -hmm. not something people tend to think about. The <laughs> amino acids that make up the meat are so low quality that it's treated like sugar. Mm -hmm. Yet, we think of chicken as a good food to eat. And it's, it's really something that's, that's become something that... It, it, because we do it, we continue to do it. I look at things like the microbiome in not so much of a different way. So what's the biology of the microbiome? Well, if you look at ancestral crops, they had about 10 times as many bacterial and fungal species as modern crops. Right. Now, what's interesting is if you take humans who exist in non-urbanized, and I mean the, the ultra-rural, indigenous type, uh, type people, mm -hmm. and you look at their microbiomes, they're about 10 times as diverse as people who live in United States, you take them out, their microbiome within about seven days reduces in diversity, hmm. and their autoimmune disease goes up. So what's really interesting when we think about the microbiome of crops? Well, you see the same thing that you saw in humans that leads to disease. Right. Perhaps what it means today in our modern system is we're actually feeding people diseased crops. And the notion <laughs> that we can actually restore health by providing back a microbiome gives us a new handle on thinking about what is health, what is a healthy plant. Now, I'm not an advocate of growing food in a dish. That be, but that being said, I am an advocate of thinking about how can we make agriculture better? How can we make it healthier? How can we make it something that can actually be less, de uh, less destructive to land uh, and something that can actually be sustainable much longer than the 60, say, cycles that's anticipated? This is why I knew that when you raised microbiome, he was the right guy to ask <laughs> uh, in that question. And, I, and I, th you know, I was reading about one of your companies that you've invested in is actually going through 40,000 different microbes and finding out which of those might have positive impacts. As I understand it, you're painting it on seeds or something of the sort. <laughs> How's that going? Very, very well. Um, well that's my short answer. Yeah. Um, the, the longer answer is, so it's turned out we've been able to systematically uncover the nature of the microbiome in a whole set of crops, what's happened over time, and ways that we can improve all sorts of, um, uh, all, all sorts of traits in crops. And I use that word a little bit, um, uh, a little bit out, of, out of proper use because we're not doing anything, say, genetic. There is no genetic modification. All we're doing is restoring some of the things that are associated with the older, if you will, healthier crops. And what it does is it leads to things like... It's like heirloom tomatoes, but it's heirloom people or heirloom microbi <laughs> microbiome. 
Well, you know, heirloom to yeah. me tends to mean old and handed down by, I mean, I know there's a different definition, yeah. but it, <laughs> I, I like to think of it as, as, as better. Uh, <laughs> uh, let, let me ask you a question, uh, Emily, on, on what you've now taken on with the task. There was a great Fortune magazine article about how you wanted to change your life, you wanted to get back into the innovation of what was going on, create sustainable, clean tech, growth and ag and, and, and broadly. Uh, and so you were hanging out with guys in a stuffy, uh, uh, forgotten manufacturing no plant, no ventilation. <laughs> uh, and they said, well, you're cool. You know, you can be executive director at no pay unless you go get uh, your own salary. Which How is all of that going? Because it, 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 <laughs> you seem to have uh, uh, created a booming place of innovation in the, in the kind of clean space. Yeah, well, it's going great today. Um, we are the largest clean tech incubator in the United States, and agriculture is a very important part of the portfolio of companies that we work with. Uh, so Greentown Labs currently supports about 50 companies, and what they have in common mm. is that they're all solving really big problems about the en energy or the environment. And we particularly focus on companies different from the ones that Dave works with that are really doing things around hardware. Right. So we might be likely to support the drone company mm -hmm. that is looking at the crops from above, or the IoT company that is trying to understand the analytics of how plants are growing, um, or a company that is building in-home aquaponic systems mm -hmm. um, and the app that goes to monitor those systems. So it's, it's a different um, subset in terms of the type of companies that we have, but very much um, it's a, just a fantastic community of folks that are interested in solving a very big problem. And, and are, I mean, you've run through a, f uh, a few of them, but maybe you could be a little bit more specific on the ag side um, as to whether any of these are getting the traction to scale. Yes, yeah, so we work with fairly early stage companies. So these folks are coming to us typically at the prototyping stage. I see. So, but they've had a round of funding already. Yes, they've typically right. had a round of seed funding. And they come to us and they work in our laboratory, building prototypes, testing prototypes, evaluating prototypes, uh, testing prototypes in a real world environment, talking to customers. And then that action, which often takes about two years, mm -hmm. really is what enables them to launch the company and to be able to raise the round of investment that, say, would be five to fifteen million dollars, that and gets them out Dave of the incubator. You call Dave and say, "Hey, you want to? Have you bought any of their companies yet? Have you guys met before?" We've we've yes. definitely met before. We haven't been investing as actively in clean tech recently, but mm -hmm. back in the day, we used to cross paths uh, quite a bit. Where do you see the opportunities that that you think are emerging uh, in the ag arena that that might not be commonplace to us? I mean, I think there's a number of different places. So some that are more of the obvious things that people are thinking about, which is uh, opportunities around what does gene editing and the future of gene editing mean, opportunities around uh, data and how that can actually be applied s more systematically. Mm -hmm. um, but what's partly getting interested, what's getting really interesting is um, despite the fact that very good people have been working in this area for a long time, we're actually just starting to understand the components of biology that actually go into a plant. And I think as we start understanding more and more pieces of the biology, we're going to be able to have better control over uh, what ultimately can happen, how strong a plant can be, what it ultimately can do. Um, we'll get into really interesting questions of what actually defines a plant as a plant or a species as a species. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that's going to take us into some very fun spaces. You know, one of the questions I didn't get into with the last panel um, and, and would have liked to is, is innovation in the food waste um, space, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, something Emily works on quite a bit, but but it raises the interesting question is as, as we think about greater production, better seeds, uh, transferring technology to Africa, uh, being sensitive to the to the microbiome or diversity of that area, you know th that's an entirely different conversation. I just wonder if you could put that on hold for five years, all hmm. those things, whether there would be more attention that was all of a sudden focused on the staggering levels of food waste and what was going on there. And I'm just interested in whether either of you kind of deal with that and whether there is a relationship or not in terms of our success, because I would say 90% of the discussions I've had are always on how to increase yield, how to increase productivity, how, mm -hmm. to, how to do it better, how to, how to do some of these other things. Very, very little on the food waste side. Is that your sense? I'd say that there actually are quite a few companies out there who are addressing this problem. I don't think that we have one today at Greentown Labs, although we do have companies working in waste area in general and trying to reuse that waste in some way. So mm. for example, reusing methane waste from a landfill. 
Um, but I think there are a lot of opportunities in that area. And so I would definitely say if you're an entrepreneur that knows about a weight or has an idea to solve this problem, the ground is open for you. Dave, what do you think about this? So a couple components on it. One, the, the broad waste area is something we have thought about a lot of. We haven't done much in the space, and it's for a couple reasons. It's not to say it's not important, uh, because as Emily said, there are people who are working on this. There are people who are thinking about it. Um, it opens up one question, which actually goes back to your question a bit, of separating food versus nutrition. Right. Because mm -hmm. if you think about extracting out nutrients, then waste actually becomes a really good place to be able to find high density nutrition. Mm. But the second is, and at the end of the day, we are, and we, we're, a, we're a company that's creating new technologies, investing in them, but we have our own investors who we're supposed to deliver a re return to, and so we need a path by which we can see financial success. The value chain in waste has been more challenging, and it suffers from a problem that I call, um, sorry for the crudeness of it, the who cares problem, mm. which is if you solve the, the food waste problem, the real question is, who's going to take notice? And I'm not talking about writing a, a piece about how important this is, because it is, and it is important, but there aren't people who are there paying for it and painting over it such that they'll pay disproportionately. When you see that pain point that causes people to do unnatural things, that makes for a very good investment opportunity. And that's why there's a lot more on the supply side, because you can see who needs it. You can see the answer to the who cares question. Let me ask you both about the ecosystem for research and support here. Dave, I know you've got a, more than 200 patents out there. You've got a successful incubator in the clean tech space. A lot of people in the audience interested in ag, which is so surprising to me in Boston, and maybe that's my own <laughs> uh, ignorance. But, but our, our, I mean, it, part of, I think, why we're doing this here is to bring people together, look at what some of the deficits may be, uh, and how to uh, stimulate even more innovation thinking out right, right here in this area and region. And, and given the fact that you've both been phenomenally successful, but let me just you know, say, if you were to push higher, if you were to work with people in the room, what are some of the missing things here that you'd like to see fixed that might enhance uh, innovation in the ag area in, in the Northeast uh, Boston area? Yeah. I'd say, that, so the biggest challenge, which is also the biggest opportunity, is that Boston is the single greatest space for biotech. Mm. The traditional space for biotech has been to take you into drugs and secondarily right. into devices and other sorts of health tech type innovations. And the good news is, um, unless something massively changes over the next handful of years, it is a robust industry. It's one that we care about. It's one where diseases have not been right. getting better. Um, and that takes people away from thinking about ag. Mm. Um, the reason that's also a good thing, though, is one of the best places for ag innovation mm. is biotech innovation. And I think what we're starting to see is a slope that's allowing for a translation of these insights much faster into agriculture. So if we think about recombinant technologies mm. going into drugs right. versus agriculture, there was, a, there was a delay. If you think about the delay between drugs and agriculture for CRISPR, we have right. CRISPR products on the market. We don't right. have CRISPR drugs on the market, right. CRISPR ag products. So you said we're about, fifth, there's a lag of about 15 years, right? Is it? It had been, but right. I think that lag time is cutting back pretty, pretty, it's actually getting a lot better such that the translation's happening faster. And, and, and as you look at this area, what do you think would be um, either, I mean, it could, sometimes it can be just, just inspiration, sometimes it can actually be working with the city, the county, research, whatever, but what do you feel that would be an enhancer to the kind of work you do? Well, I think that a lot of the work that is done in agriculture, a lot of the research work is actually done in universities that are in the middle of the country and mm -hmm. kind of closer to the farm. So a lot of the innovation So being is close to the farm is something you don't have here. I would say um, we're maybe not as close to the farm as uh, some of the Midwestern universities that would be, you know, having these uh, various extension programs that are uh, typically a way that some of that innovation gets out into the market. I think we are, like Dave said, very strong in the biotech side, mm. um, but I know that the folks that we have uh, within Greentown Labs are often, you know, kind of going elsewhere to be inspired or to talk directly to folks that are um, really kind of relevant to what they're building. So, I mean, that said, I think Boston and uh, this area is building a mm. strong ecosystem in the ag space. And just before I go to the audience, Dave, you had, you had some, you, we were, I read this wonderful, these, 
I mean, you, you seem to be, uh, at least off stage, very irreverent and iconoclastic and in your face, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, and, and said, we ought to really, really be eating crickets uh, rather <laughs> than chickens. And, and you, in, in what I've read about you, you, it sort of seems to be imbued with this notion that you think that we have a lot of, you know, false uh, illusions about our food space and that, that, <laughs> that we, we could benefit from revisiting a lot of these things and tearing down some of these myths, and I'm, I'm interested in I don't know, just give me two, two other three or uh, uh, two or three other zingers, uh, uh, if you will, in terms of what you think the barriers to our own imaginations are as we think about the ag space. Uh oh, that that really feels like it's putting me on the spot there. Mm -hmm. huh. um, I mean, I do. I 100% I agree. Ag is filled with a bunch of misperceptions. Um, I'll, I'll just mention a couple things, just as. as some historical components. Uh, and, um, so one, for example, uh, people always take this firm view on genetic mo genetically modified organisms, GMOs, right. uh, as being good or bad. Now, when you go back, part of the reason that GMs actually existed was Monsanto was trying to shove GM down the throat of the French grocery stores. Mm. And the GM concept came up as a basis for these grocery stores pushing back against Monsanto. It wasn't that it was good or bad. But as a result of that pushback, it became a good or bad thing, and it was sort of a pseudo-organic versus non-organic thing. The problem with that mm. is we don't actually have the real information, and it's become such a polarized debate that we don't know whether GMs are good or are bad. Mm. I'm, and that's not my, it's not my opinion as to whether they're good or they're right. bad, but when we're facing real, t real challenges with our food system, we really should right. know yeah. whether bio biotechnology is a good thing or a bad thing. And now when we look at CRISPR, which is a really powerful tool, people talk a lot about how it should be regulated. The best part about it, because all of the rules about biotech regulation were written decades ago, you can get around all of them, and I could rewrite a whole genome without it being genetically modified, hmm. by definition. Sort of a crazy little thing that, that's showing up in the space, but it's getting to this point where people are asking these questions of, am I innovating for the betterment of mankind, or am I innovating to get around laws? And right. unfortunately in ag, we do a little too much of the latter. Interesting. Any final thoughts on this subject? I think that there are lots of opportunities for entrepreneurs out there to tackle this area. And so I would encourage anyone that has an idea to just go forth. And you've got good support resources here in Boston. You have places like the incubator that we run, but there's also a number of different groups out there that are really uh, collectively growing this ecosystem here. That's great. Let me go to the audience and take questions, comments. Yes, right here. We're going to bring you a mic. Okay, uh, I have to apologize. This one actually goes back to some, some earlier stuff. We're, We're going to bring you the microphone right here. Yeah. yeah. Just hand it over. That'd be great. Uh, I have to apologize. And, this and one, tell us who you are. Hey, Sarah Tabor. Uh, I do a lot of operations consulting with a lot of your indoor ag startups. Um, this one goes back to a little bit of the, um, the ethical issues we've been talking about. Right. And it does relate to entrepreneurship as well. Um, when we're talking about ethical concerns, a lot of it tends to focus around IP and what that means for companies and entrepreneurs as they develop. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see a lot of discussion of the ethics of the, the human outfall of innovation and how that changes people's relationship to production. Um, I actually see a lot of good potential in there. So I really mm -hmm. want to see uh, Indorag talk about that more. I'll give you an example. When I was a postdoc, um, Part of my job was working in, in field genetics right. with blueberries. Mm -hmm. I was working with a convict labor crew. That was who my work crew was. That's who they gave me to work with. Right. Um, that was because, again, agricultural labor is something that people really want to be cheap because the business models in agriculture require that. You see now with polit political stuff going on, um, there's a loss of that cheap labor supply. Everybody's going build the wall. They're trying to cut immigrant labor down. Right. What I'm seeing is someone who works in agriculture Folks think that's going to lead to higher paying agricultural jobs. What it's really leading to is more prisoner labor. And that's building a situation where there's more economic incentive for mass incarceration. Mm -hmm. So what I see the potential... So your question. So my question is, yeah. um, are, is there anybody who's looking at the ethical implications of, hey, we have modes of production that enable us to pay more job, uh, to have better jobs as a result of automation? People freak out about, oh, we're going to lose jobs, but they, don't f they forget that those jobs we're losing kind of belong to prisoners with right, jobs. Right. Um, is there anybody talking about that, I guess, is my question. So I have thoughts on that, but I'll turn to you, Dave, first, and, and, and your thoughts on, on this question of 
progress versus the tensions it creates. Yeah, it's it's always an interesting it's it's always an interesting challenge to be thinking about. I mean, I think people always do try to figure out what is technology going to do positively and negatively. And I think for the lion's share of our our time in the past of estimating these things, we've always gotten about 100 percent wrong. Mm. Um, so from my standpoint, I always try to think about what is the worst thing that can happen. But when you're making your decisions, just assume that they're going to be. I, I always think you make the decisions that you you know are wrong, but are hopefully not bad wrong. Mm -hmm. um, people are thinking about that, but there's a lot of pieces that go into some of these elements. So the government, for example, has done a very good job of dealing with some of what's happened historically in ag by uh, allowing small farms to survive. There's a strong interest in having small farms. It's important for society. It's important for rural communities. Um, a big part of the reason that organic exists as a label is to support farms under 25,000 acres. Um, so I think there's, there is some thinking about it. It's not an area where innovation has traditionally played the primary role because the effects are so downstream that you can't necessarily anticipate it. And the speed of, I hate saying it in this way, the speed of some of the random government activities that we might see in the short term are way faster than the innovation cycle of being able to have its, in, 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 its impact on the markets, uh, even though it's usually the other way around. So I think people are thinking about it, but not quite the way you're describing. Emily, quick reaction? I think people are absolutely thinking, that, thinking about that really across clean tech um, in terms of robotics especially. But there can be benefits um, as well. I mean, you look at, we have other companies who are working in, on uh, developing robotics that are going to replace workers in a warehouse, right? So you may be replacing jobs there, but you are actually reducing the energy costs. You are reducing the amount of energy used. You are reducing the amount of lighting needed, the amount of heating needed. So sometimes there can be trade-offs, and I think that that's important to think through. I, I would say, I mean, I, one, I'm glad you're asking those questions. And I think there's probably more action there than, than it looks. I mean, one of the interesting things, on the, again, this industrial farm I looked at, they installed these, um, one of these in Israeli innovations on uh, through the ground um, irrigation. So rather than irrigation from above, it's irrigation that basically seeps through balloon-like things in the ground. It's very fascinating. And on the eastern shore of Maryland, it's remarkable because there's not an, a, a particular shortage of water there, but you have lots of problems of runoff and other kinds of things. And, and you can put that within the ethical context. One of the areas what I've been uh, interested in is the area of a autonomous vehicles down the road uh, and the four million mm -hmm. uh, lesser educated, mostly men, uh, not all men, who drive trucks. And this is going to be an area with huge displacement. So it, again, raises the question of what are those public... I think every area that you begin to think of drives these impacts and concerns, and it raises eventually concerns of how do you assess the, you know, as you said, people's relationship with food, which you were talking about, or people's relationship with farms. And I think that the conversations are very important, so I want to thank you to it. Let me take one last question. Yes, sir, right here. Hi. I'm Pat Christianitis, and I'm an ag salesman. And a comment and a question. Yes, sir. Um, first with David, there are a lot of misperceptions in agriculture. And 40 years ago when I was at school at UMass, they knew all about the microbial population. There wasn't money to be made in it, hmm. which is the difference today. UMass still promotes good agriculture is good biological um, diversity. But for Emily, the reason for the funding in the Midwest universities for a lot of the innovations, isn't that because of the commodities market and mm. the acreage out there versus the smaller acreages on the coast? Quick thoughts on microbial awareness uh, way back when. Thoughts, Dave? Yeah, so it, it's a great point. Uh, I always separate discovery from innovation uh, mm. because it is important to re recognize the discovery. I'll give a quick example of just something even more extreme. Uh, the importance of bacteria in cancer has been mm. recognized going back to the 1850s. Mm. Um, that's never been acted upon until a company now doing it and will be in the, for the first time in clinical trials next year. Uh, so to me, there's this question of how do you take these understandings and insights and actually do something that productizes them or brings mm. them in a way that can be useful. So it's obviously a really important recognition. Uh, we view our roles as being innovators as opposed to the original scientific discoverers. Uh, but again, it's important and I'll just just make one more comment. Um, great that you're, you're from UMass. I think one of the things, going back to one of the previous questions, that's really important 
here, we've had a huge influx of the healthcare companies come into this area, and that's been great for us building an ecosystem here. Mm -hmm. What we haven't yet had is the same sort of infl influx in the agriculture companies, mm -hmm. uh, which gets a little bit to your other points, and I think that will be great for uh, continuing innovation in that space as well. Emily? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm really sharing the experience of some of our startups. Um, so that's, that's the um, information that I have about um, kind of where the innovation is coming from. So it's kind of a first-hand source. Let me just ask you real quickly, both. One of the other things is sometimes we're looking for celebrity geniuses. I, Walter Isaacson's just written about Da Vinci, but he wrote about Steve Jobs. Um, I was learning around one of the uh, great uh, uh, vaccine uh, creators um, uh, who's, who developed more than uh, 40 different vaccines out there. In the ag space, is there, uh, other than yourselves, a genius that we should know about that uh, uh, is, is, is going to be life-altering? Well, I have to comment on two companies, mm -hmm. uh, Raptor Maps, who is uh, a company that is doing uh, aerial farm analytics, right. uh -huh. as well as Grove Labs, who is doing um, home growing Grove systems. Grove Labs yes. and Raptor? Raptor Maps. Raptor. And tell me what Grove is doing? Um, home growing systems. Home growing systems. Yes. So back into the home, mm -hmm. like 3D printing at home, right? Absolutely. So, okay, good. And, and Dave? I, the first name that came to my head when you, when you put that out there was Norman Borlaug. Um, and I'm trying to think about who the modern equivalent is, but I think we're waiting to see. Uh, interesting. Well, thank you very much, David Berry with Flagship and Emily Reichert with Greentown Labs. Thank you both very much for this conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you to Steve, Joey, and to all of our speakers today and for, for such insightful conversations. And once again, I'd like to thank our underwriter, Bayer, for making today possible. Um, and as I look to our left and I see how this conversation has come to life, um, we have terms and phrases we've used today like um, Boston is an innovation ecosystem, energy from manure, could the jellyfish lead to, could this lead to jellyfish with eggs? Diverse cover crop, innovation, idealism versus realism. Email tomato, I don't know what, what we were thinking when we had that one. Um, but anyway, before you go, I have one request. You'll get an email from me with a survey, and there are some copies here in the room. We'd love your feedback if you could fill those out. Um, and we'd love if you could stay. We'll have a little reception. Join us for a glass of wine. You can mix and mingle with some of our folks um, and have a bite to eat and get to know all of the great people in this room. Um, and we really thank you all for turning out today. Have a great evening. Thank you.